Welcome to the American Hardcore Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Blush. This podcast is an ongoing conversation with the great musicians and non-musicians of the American Hardcore Punk scene. Back in 1980, I went off to college in Washington, D.C., where I stumbled upon this incredible new punk energy with bands like the Bad Brains and Minor Threat. I dove headfirst into it. I became the kid concert promoter. I booked all the DC bands. I booked Minor Threat and PIL. I booked Minor Threat and Trouble Funk. Uh, I booked all the great bands as they came through town, Black Flag, Circle Jerks, Dead Kennedys. Half these bands crashed on my couch. So it was a real life-changing experience. And years later, what I came to learn is that I, in fact, have two sets of values. I have those values instilled by my family, and I have that fierce DIY ethic that I got from the hardcore punk scene. And that, in a nutshell, is how I started the American Hardcore book, then the American Hardcore film, and now the American Hardcore podcast. So thank you for checking us out. Like I said, when we're talking about punk and hardcore, we're talking not just about music, we're talking about the culture that surrounds it. Many of you listening are members of that culture, and quite a few of you have checked out the American Hardcore book and the American Hardcore film. And for that, I want to thank you for your support. Uh, what I've learned from all the feedback over the years is that there's this incredible thirst for knowledge, for the minutia and the backstories of this project. So I thought to myself, who best to talk about the real deal behind the American hardcore story than George Petros, the editor and art director of the American hardcore book. Welcome to the American hardcore podcast, George Petros. Thank you, Stephen Blush. It's really a pleasure to have you here. George is an old friend. Um, we go back to the late 80s. Um, I think the first time I really got to know you was we were on this ill-fated record company cruise from hell involved with the band Skinny Puppy. And soon thereafter, you started writing for My Seconds magazine. And then you became the editor of the magazine during its heyday where we, where we were breaking bands like Tool and Soundgarden and Faith No More. So talk about that. Uh, talk about... Um, experiencing that, you know, you weren't really coming out of music per se, but it was a really exciting time and you really saw this explosion happen firsthand. Well, the uh, concert we met at that you mentioned was at a CMJ in 1987 and Capitol Records did a showcase for their newest signing, Skinny Puppy, and they held, they had rented the Staten Island Ferry. And so they took a bunch of us out on the ferry. Mark Mothersbaugh of Devo got me into that, uh, onto that particular show. And um, I was with Elizabeth Rodriguez and they took us out on the ferry and we went around the harbor a little bit and uh, did some sightseeing. And, and as the ferry pulled back into the terminal, everybody was up in the front to exit. But rather than the exit being there, uh, the um, the like dock was made up as a stage and Skinny Puppy started playing. And uh, that was a pretty exciting moment, I guess, as far as spectacle goes. But you were on board that uh, cruise and you had copies of the third issue, I think, or second or third issue of Seconds Magazine, a new publication that you had just been putting together. And you'd heard about me through like Rob Kennedy and, and these guys. And so you came up, he said, hey, check out my magazine. I'm like, oh, hi, you know, I'm Steve, I'm George. It was one of those moments. And we kind of exchanged formalities and then sort of kept in touch after that. And then I started writing for the next issue, which I guess was a third issue. And I did a lot of like the kind of local underground bands and Philly underground bands and uh, so on. And um, Seconds got started to take off. And you had some really good connections in the music business. So like you said, we like helped to break bands like Soundgarden and Faith No More. But, you know, that continued on through the entire uh, 
era of the magazine. I mean, we were the first magazine to do Marilyn Manson as a cover, as a national story. Um, you know, in preparing for this discussion, I wanted to have like a list of bands of all these people we started. I mean, everybody, PM Dawn, you know, you name it, black, white, we were doing everything, metal, punk, um, you know, we were right there in the beginning of the techno thing. But uh, most importantly, I felt like um, seconds got cranking right as the digital age was beginning. So the nature of music was changing in that now um, it was possible to reach into the past and uh, hear this stuff that was coming out on CD that had been obscure or you know, forgotten for decades. So that changed music a lot. Um, Seconds was at the forefront of all this. We got, we got big. Um, I think we were the, probably by distribution and sales, the fifth largest music mag in the country for a long time. And uh, we had some pretty heavy hitting competition, all of whom hated us, but looked to us for, you know, quote unquote research and you know we did we were this was a great idea of yours you know an all interview magazine well wasn't it funny that within a couple of years every other rock magazine was an all interview magazine and uh but nobody had what we had you know um yeah it, it was really an incredible time and it was also during this time that i began on the american hardcore book um what are your memories of the very beginning of this project back in the mid nineties? I mean, I remember all these so-called legends of hardcore coming by the seconds office all the time, but what, what are your um, memories of that? Uh, when I first launched the idea, what your thought was behind it and how you helped uh, help me grow this idea? Well, it, um, I think it was an idea that was always gestating with you since day one, because you have a bit of a historian in you and a bit of an archivist and you pay attention to things. So um, you were always keeping mental notes on all this stuff. So you talked a lot about uh, hardcore. Primarily, it seems Black Flag was your focus. They were sort of the, uh, like the, the, the center point of your ideation about, about hardcore. And I guess that was personal taste and your relationship with them. So you talked a lot about Black Flag and it expanded from there to like other bands and mostly comparing them to Black Flag because Black Flag was like the holy, that was like the New York Jets are to you, Black Flag was to you. And, uh, but that's for another discussion. And, um, and I just noticed over time that you had all these, uh, what are not ideas, but just all these, these, these comments and, and observations, and you started thinking about maybe I should write this down, maybe I should gather this up for history and for posterity. And, uh, and um, like the beginning of many books, you know, there's not one clear point where you say the book began then, but before you knew it, you had just accumulated all these notes and, and so on. And um, when you were writing about some of these bands for seconds, I think you were putting a little bit of your stuff aside for a potential future project. And, you know, of course, I don't remember any specific conversations, but before you knew it, we were talking about, oh, you ought to do a book. I ought to, you know, put this into writing. You know so much about this and you ought to write, put this down. And uh, somehow a book was just uh, underway before anybody knew it. And, because I was the seconds editor, well, you know, you know I was the um, became the editor of American Hardcore. I don't even think you had a name for it then. And uh, um, these characters, as as you as you started the project, you you got in touch with these guys. They're not an easy group to deal with. You know, we 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 say American we say hardcore as if it's a, like a like a a genre that's well defined, but it wasn't then. These guys were all over the place, both socioeconomically and politically. There were some people that would answer a call. There were some people that didn't have telephones. There were some people that nobody knew how to get a hold of them, uh, and and so on. So the, the, then began the process of trying to 
bring all these people together, many of whom hated one another, many of whom said, I never want to talk about that stuff again. This was about 20 years beyond its heyday. So it was just at that point where people had either like uh, grown out of it or like um, consolidated themselves into it as a, as a, as a way of life, as a lifestyle. So um, he, go ahead. No, I was no. going to say you were really key to keeping this product focused. I mean, not only in terms of actually completing it, but also in terms of separating punk from hardcore. So kind of talk about that. Because, you know, punk is more, oh, we talk more about fashion or trend and hardcore being more of this like intense lifestyle, I guess. Right. Well, as rock journalists, you know, it was, uh, we, we had a tendency to like look at big pictures and uh, broad trajectories and everything. But when it came to the subject of hardcore, I noticed that um, it was really different than the stuff around it. And you were a big punk fan, and this was really, I felt that was really different than punk. It was really a, a whole different phenomenon. And, um, but because of the marketing and the style and everything, the two things were very intertwined and uh, shared audience and so on. So I felt like one of my early contributions was to say, Steve, now let's keep this about these hardcore guys specifically and not about punk. The look and feel is very, very similar, but we have to be very careful because the ultimate intention of it and the ultimate result of the two scenes were very different from one another. Mm -hmm. I felt that um, punk was really just like 70s rock 2.0. It was just like the uh, the inverse of it, but it was the, the same phenomenon. Um, 70s rock had been become imbued with like ostentation. It was very Baroque. It was very, uh, you know, like uh, pseudo intellectual. It was very uh, just, uh, you know, the adjectives for it can go on and on. And then here came like a, the next generation who kind of, uh, we like to say rebelled against, but really it was just like, couldn't keep up with the 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 production values and the, the the financial necessities that were involved in making the 70s rock so they just stripped it down and uh but it was still right you know it was still the beatles just uh you know with uh, with a minimalist uh angle to it and um the other thing was that rock had to an extent extolled, I don't want to say beauty, but good looks, hot guys, hot chicks, you know, so it took a certain type to be a rock star. And the punks came along and said, well, you know, we're not, we might not be beautiful, we might not be hot, but, you know, we're still can get up on a stage and, uh, you know, crank up a lot of energy and get you dancing and moshing with us and everything like that. So um, it was a it was a democratization of, of the potentiality of being a rock star. You know, now an ugly fat person could be a, uh, you know, could get up there and knock him dead. You didn't have to be, uh, you know, have a $20 million, uh, you know, record production deal behind you to, uh, to get famous. The Sex Pistols are, of course, the uh, quintessential reference point for the beginning of this. They weren't cute, although I'm sure that the London girls thought they were pretty hot, but you know, they weren't cute by rock standards, but they pulled it off. They got everybody excited, but it was just, it was still rock 2.0. It was still like an early Beatles album, just more cacophonous and, uh, uh, you know, uh, hard. Hardcore by contrast was not a reaction to a musical scene it wasn't like a like an attempt to uh come in through the back door of of you know the rock establishment um hardcore was more of a reaction to politics and the the, the zeitgeist of the moment and the music merely was like a vehicle that these 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 hardcore kids used to express their angst and their alienation and their anger and their predictions for the future. So the music was, I don't want to say secondary, but they weren't, these weren't guys who really were 
driven by a muse. You know, they were driven by uh, just, uh, you know, not being in the in crowd, let's say. Although we learned later that that was an affectation. And, you know, nowadays, everybody I mention in Cardinal, oh, yeah, he went to some private school or, you know, his parents were rich and everything. But you would have never guessed it at the time. But there was a lot of poor people, too. But so that was a difference between punk and hardcore. Punk was, punk had the pretensions of politics and a political perspective and but, but it really wasn't. It was really just the rock establishment, you know, finding a new way to market to a new generation that was a little more, that was a lot different than the previous generation. Hardcore was none of that. These were kids who just took it upon themselves to like uh, make their scene happen. Um, they didn't have any help. And, uh, and yeah, so, it was just very, very different. And I wanted you, because I knew that you recognized that difference because you had spoken about it so much, um, you know, spoken about it in your descriptions of the various bands that you dealt with. And I, I started to pick up that, um, you know, A is much different than B. So I wanted to keep you focused. If we're going to do a hardcore book, let's do it about hardcore. Let's not like have our introduction to it mention the Sex Pistols. And I say the Sex Pistols no, with no agenda. You know, they're fine. I like John Lydon. You know, they they were. You know, I liked them at the time. So I don't mean to use them as like a, you know, a punching bag for this this uh, example of this this stuff. But um, but hardcore was not the Sex Pistols. But you know, the audiences were overlapping yeah so we it was all about keeping you uh, focused on hardcore hardcore not punk now an important part to all this too is there's you know there were so many rewrites to get it to that point um one really important character was someone key to the hardcore explosion and that was jerry williams who produced the bad brains and the beastie boys first record so talk about uh jerry's involvement Jerry Lee Williams was a really fantastic guy from South Carolina, came up to New York, um, was not a punk, was not a, uh, not really a scenester of any type, just a cool guy. And um, before I knew him, he opened a studio, was it uh, 7A? 171A. 171A, yeah. And um, threw his doors open to the local scenesters which at that point happened to be a lot of hardcore guys and the beastie boys the bad brains and um he's a good example of a person who worked hard was responsible for so much of a sound of a scene but has been kind of overlooked by history because the character has failed to give him the shout outs and the accolades which he deserved and that always hurt me. But he was so, yeah, he was a Southern guy. He was a real liberal guy. He was one of these, um, he was a vegan. He was uh, kind of a, not a spiritual or metaphysical guy, but there was kind of a phenomenon of that era where it was sort of a, uh, oh, I don't know how to describe it, like, uh, like a karmic, like a, like a proto new age guy. You know, the veganism, the, uh, like when he rolled a joint, he wouldn't use papers that had glue on them because the glue came from animal products. And, uh, and he proselytizes stuff and he had a big influence on a lot of the people around him. So anyway, the, this crop of that generation there in the, the Lower East Side came to him because it was a cheap place to practice, open late. You know, you probably smoke pot in there or, or whatever you were getting high on, drink. So he was, you know, Jerry was open-minded to say the least. And um, this was before I knew him, but my, from what I understand, he was the guy who, as a producer and uh, uh, like mentor, helped to shape the sound of the Beastie Boys, the Bad Brains, and you know, there's a couple of other the Crow other, Mags, yeah. The, well, the Crow Mags especially, yeah. The Crow Mags was probably the only one of those bands that ever gave him the shout out that he was deserving of the you know everybody else seemed to just kind of move on to the next 
phase of their commercial success without ever really looking back and saying, thanks, Jerry, for everything you did for us. And as you know, I've told you stories Jerry's told me about potentially what would be malfeasance on the part of some of these guys who work with him, where the argument could be made, they ripped them off, they took advantage of them, et cetera. But he had a, he had a way of producing that was, uh, that was hard, but not harsh. And um, I mean, I, I, I can't really articulate it too well, his, the, but if you listen to a Chromax record or an early Bad Brains record, that's Jerry Williams. You know, he was came out of, of course, of the 70s. He was older than these guys, which afforded him the opportunity to mentor them. And uh, but he was but he was always had his ear to the ground to hear what was coming up next. He was always looking for the next sound. But you know, he came out of jazz. He came out of Miles Davis and John Coltrane, and you know the Beatles and the Stones. So he had this whole array of of of. I don't want to say influences, but this just this whole, how would they say this in like modern academia? He had a a a basket of 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 musical genres on which he could draw, something like that. So yeah, he made these guys happen in a nutshell. Talk about your editorial vision for American hardcore as over time, because I'm sure you honed it as it, but a lot of it was just keeping it very hardcore. Well, keeping it very hardcore, but also, to me, the most important thing was to keep the politics neutral. Now, I know you personally are capable of being neutral politically and approaching this kind of stuff sort of as an anthropologist. But the scene itself um, felt, you know, or, or, or aspired to be political. And so... Um, it was easy in the editorial to like kind of follow the lead of the subject we were writing, you were writing about. Um, hardcore, interestingly, was both of the left and of the right, at least initially. And the way American, the American political discourse is structured now as, as well as back then is like, you know, you love your side, you hate the other guys. So there's never objectivity brought to bear about, uh, you know, the other side. In this case, obviously, the hardcore of the right. And um, my idea was, please, let's keep this neutral. You know, if somebody comes up there and is uh, extolling things that uh, are, would nowadays would be politically correct, so what? That's what the scene was. This is anthropology. We're writing about what they think, not about what we think about what they think. And that was my whole thing. Step back two or three uh, levels and let the, you know, let it flow and appreciate it for what it is, for the social and political phenomenon that it is. And do not be judgmental about it at all. And also recognize the larger and titanic forces that shape music and shape the music scene and uh you know take those into account you know take into account the behind the scenes marketing and and propaganda and everything so that when somebody makes a statement you can see it just in the clarity of its own uh you know just as it comes right from that person's soul and don't filter you know, don't don't put filters of, of, of judgment and uh, and refer you know referential stuff onto it. So I wanted that. I wanted it to be neutral politically, because it was so in the the scene was so interesting politically. It was one of the first times ever that there had been that the right had a voice anywhere in the in the the, the musical milieu anywhere. Um, course it was soon squelched and drowned out and invalidated but nonetheless it was very powerful for the moment you know there was a lot of imagery that was drawn from fascism and national socialism and communism and all these authoritarian systems that were very out of fashion with the mainstream at the time um so there was that there was also the idea like let's not let these people like 
get too self-aggrandizing. You know, let's kind of hold their feet to the fire and, uh, you know, hold them accountable for, you know, where, what, for what didn't work and kind of like the failures are just as important of stories as the successes. So I wanted, you know, I wanted the whole spectrum of, of experience in there as far as uh, success, failure, instead of just, uh, well, yeah, so, so that was a, sorry, I'm getting a little off key on that one, but those were, that, the, 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 new, the political neutrality was, the, uh, was my, I guess, my, my greatest hope that the book would be politically neutral, and it was, and that was a brilliant thing on your part, because there is no other music book where the writer is, seems to have just been able to empty their head before they went into it and, uh, you know, take, you know, interview somebody who might be an, um, and I don't mean this in your case literally, but to interview like somebody who might be an ideological enemy or a threat to you or, you know, and, and not to go there as like a peacemaker or as a appeaser, but just to say, hey, what's on your mind, you know, so we got that. And I think that I think that that, that I was successful in keeping the thing neutral. Well, I, I would totally agree with that. I also wanted to talk to you about the art direction. Um, you know, every image looks hardcore. If it looked a little punk, it was like out the window and it's actually placed by the location of the text, excruciating detail placed on that. And then also yeah. there's the front cover, which is the real selling point, this Edward Culver photo that you were able to determine should be the cover. And then it was colorized by Eric Hammer, which really brought out this incredible color. And it was, you know, there really hadn't been a book like, you know, with a cover like that ever. But talk about how this whole project came together in terms of the look. Well, a book about hardcore has got to look like hardcore. So hardcore was kind of emerged around the same time that Xerox machines were proliferating and becoming commonplace enough so that you could make up flyers. And the flyer became the, uh, the like iconography of hardcore. So now you, so the book should look like one of these flyers. It should be stripped down. It should have a sort of, uh, I mean, I hate to use the word punky here, but you know, it should have this sort of, uh, anti art direction anti uh, 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 finished uh, polished look it was um, uh, it, we wanted to, to look like a hardcore like a hardcore poster like a like the something that would be hanging up on a lamppost or we paste it on the side of a wall about an upcoming show so luckily a lot of this art in there is actually these show posters and these these flyers that you and others had accumulated over the years you were wise enough to like save these these th a lot of this stuff and uh i think our pal sal canzonieri had a lot of this uh Correct. you know he would and we, we can't forget his contribution I, I think jerry williams had a few of these uh a few of these posters so it was a lot of that and of course the photos that's an easy one because these kids are so stripped down looking and raw, you know, that a picture of them, you know, is going to fit right in with this, 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 this deconstructed look that, uh, that hardcore ultimately had. And, um, yeah, just, just, just raw, but the, the art to be unobtrusive, the text to be easy to read, um, you know, the line breaks to be friendly, the, the, the layout, the type size to be adequate that anybody could read it in a van while they're, you know, on tour in the back and bad lighting. Um, and that cover you talk about, yeah, that was a, a wonderful picture. Tell us again who that was. Edward Tell Culver. Us. Yeah, is it, well, Edward Culver was a photographer, and I'm sure you'll talk at length about him. He was a seminal and a very important figure and, you know, a guy we all love. And... Uh, and who has an amazing pet bird that rolls around on his fingers while you're talking to him. And, um, and 
but uh, it, it was just one of many of his his wonderful pictures. But this was this Danny Spira. This uh, yeah, Danny Spira, the singer of Wasted Youth. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it was a black and white photo. So we were fortunate enough to be working at the time with uh, Eric Hammer, who's now known as Doc Hammer, who's you know by this point has become well known for his work on I guess on Adult Swim what is it the Venture Brothers him and and Thurwell does the music for it and everything but you know he's like a computer whiz he was an early computer whiz he was one of these guys who in like the 1990s could use Illustrator really well and that was like wow you know Illustrator is like such a killer program and this guy's really good at it so he colorized it and he caught nuances of like flesh tones and blood colors and just the, the the bleakness of the background that were just, it was just, he was, he's an amazing artist and he brought all of his skills to bear in this picture. And um, it's, uh, it is one of the great book covers of all time. And of course, once we have that really dynamic picture, there's not much you can do, just stick the word American Hardcore up at the top by Stephen Blush down at the bottom, and you've got yourself a cover for the ages. Awesome. Um, what are you proudest of in terms of the American Hardcore book, and do you have any regrets or disappointments uh, with the final product? Well, the thing I'm the proudest of, outside of its phenomenal sales and the fact that I'm associated with it, thank you, and you know I'm the editor of, of this, this seminal work, but the thing I'm the proudest of goes back to what I was speaking about a little while ago is the political neutrality of it in a world of hyper partisanized hate. And this goes back then. I'm not just talking about right now. Um, we met, you managed to, uh, to present um, an entire spectrum of, of political ideas and social ideas and everything. Um, you know, without uh, any asterisks, without any winks, without any, you know, nudges. And uh, I know that irritated a lot of people because our job is, of course, is supposed to be to hate our opposition. So as, as journalists and critics, so I'm very proud of that. What do you think of the notion of uh, punk rock and hardcore today? Well, there is no such thing. I mean, these are like um, revival acts and with no disrespect. I know there's people that are doing it that work really hard at it. They're good. They're entertaining. I'm hoping they're making a good living. I'm hoping people are rocking out to it. But my interest in things like that is uh, always in the new, always in the avant-garde of things. I'm not interested in, you know, like uh, 30 year old ideas that are being recycled. And uh, um, so, when I see a punk rock band today, it's like a lot of times where like when you go to New Orleans and you see like a, a revival jazz act or like you go to a jazz club and it's like, a, you know, it sounds great, but it's just a, an existing milieu that people are working within. So I don't see these things as innovative or pushing envelopes. And that's what I want. I want something new. I want a, a new sound. Um, I would say that uh, since about 2001, um, rock, as we know, it has it ceased to exist as a uh, uh, something with forward momentum and and devolved into kind of a succession of revival acts and you know punk and hardcore. Well, hardcore. First of all, there is no hardcore. There might be hardcore bands, but because it was a it was one of these things of its time. It, it was reacting to very specific social, economic, and political uh, conditions. So you can't. You, you can't do that today and say, let's try to recreate this energy and everything because the milieu and, and the zeitgeist today are so different. Um, so I would say that you, and, and I know all the, the bands out there that aspire to be hardcore are gonna you know, hate me, how wrong I've got it and everything, but I'm sorry, but from the, looking at it from the big picture, you're a revival act. So that's what I think about uh, about that. Very few stuff has survived. Survived. Um, um, as for the guys who are still working from hardcore, that's a little different. You know, these, these and I'm not going to mention names, but these guys who are still doing their thing that were '80s guys, they're good. They're presenting their their um, 
their craft and everything to an audience that's appreciative and everybody's happy and everybody makes a few bucks off it and that's fine. But I wouldn't look to that for like guidance for the future. Okay. <laughs> So um, I could sit here and talk to you for hours, but um, I don't think uh, people want to sit and listen to us jabber for hours. Right so, yeah. Yeah. Um, We'll close this with what I call the lightning round, where I mention something or someone, and you say the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? Yeah. Favorite hardcore band? The Misfits. Least favorite hardcore band? Black Flag. <laughs> Jerry Williams. Um, he made it all happen. And I hope he rests in peace. And I Henry love, Rollins. A really intense guy. I liked him. I had some dealings with him. Um, we had some dealings with him. He's... Uh, you know, he's just an intense guy, like trying to make it through an imperfect world. Harley Flanagan. Harley, I like very much. I have a lot of respect for him. He's probably of all these guys, the one who is the closest to the hardcore ideal. He's known crime, he's known violence, he's known privation, he's known pain, he's known joy. He's worked really hard. He's um, fought his way to where he is. He, he doesn't take any BS. And from what I can tell, he's been somewhat rewarded for his efforts and I'm happy for him. He's, he's a pain in the ass to work with, I'll tell you that, but uh, rewarding. And there's nobody else like him. He stands alone because again, um, you know, crime and violence. A lot of people sing about it. A lot of people read about it and, you know, get off on it. But very few people get out there in the mix and mix it up out there on the street. And uh, Harley's uh, the real deal. And when this the dust settles and this scene puts its four faces up on Mount Rushmore, Harley should be front and center. Another person I, I want to mention, Edward Culver. Well, as I said, Edward Culver is a, a, a great guy. And I like him because he's one of these people who's a real hard-headed, you know, unfriendly, kind of nasty, but warm and friendly and not nasty at the same time, depending on which side of him you're standing, you know. And he was always very gracious and nice to me. I like his work a lot. Um, his wonderful thing with his birds and everything it tells me what a, a great person he is because of his relationship with these animals. And, uh, you know, he, um, he took some of the pictures that are the iconic definition of the era. And anybody who's in his pictures owes him a debt of gratitude. Thanks, Ed, for putting me on the map. Yeah, that's right, for sure. Um, how about Jello Biafra? Well, Jello Biafra, it's an interesting character. I like him. He's like the the court jester of of leftist uh, uh, hardcore slash punk stuff. He's smart, but um, you know, there's a kind of a uh, well. Well, it's that San Francisco political thing. You know, there's always a silliness to it. There's always a a, a you know, it goes all the way back to like Jefferson Airplane and the traditions of of San Francisco politics. There, it's snide, it's snarky. Um, you know, his very name is uh, like kind of I don't want to say ridiculous, but it's uh, it's unconventional. And um, he strikes me as a person who tries tries really hard uh, to break up to the next level. But because he's weighted down by the like the inanity of his previous outings, he never can quite, you know, get there. I know he, he's tried to break into politics. I know he's got a record company. I mean, it's successful, but it's not big. And it's like, you know, you, you can always explain that away. That's, oh, I'm trying not to sell out. Jello's kind of, uh, 
I think every generation has one of these guys who's just kind of the court jester, like I say, of, of the scene. Um, how about Stephen Blush? Stephen Blush. Well, I think if it wasn't for you, most of this stuff would be forgotten. I think there's so many people that owe you a debt of gratitude. There's so many people in music that uh, ought to be uh, buying dinner for you. Um, I think that like a lot of historians and writers, you know, you're, you haven't gotten the accolades that you deserve. Um, so I'll start with that. But having said that, I think that I've watched you, I've watched your writing career evolve. I've seen it become really solid. I think you're the, uh, you've written one of the, I don't know if the word quintessential, that's a tough one. You've written one of the most important books, not only about music, but about politics and about kids and about, uh, you know, America that's ever been put out. And I think that, uh, you know, you've done a lot of really amazing stuff. It's kind of awkward to sit here and tell your friends how, you know, how accomplished they are, but I'm very proud of having worked with you, seeing that, you know, you've gotten to where you are and you're, the movie, you know, your movie comes out on Sony. That's as big of a deal as there is. And, uh, and the subsequent stuff you've done, which has been great, and uh, watching this evolve has been a real pleasure, and I'm really happy for the, the role that I played in it, I hope. And uh, I just hope there is more coming from you. And lastly, let me just ask you about American Hardcore, the legacy, if you will. Well, American Hardcore, the book, your role in it, you know, the scene itself, which is disappointing because it's morphed into um, you know, so much of today's, the politics of the left today draw so much upon the templates of lifestyles that were put down by some of the hardcore kids. But um, as far as the legacy goes, well, Steve, you know, it's one of those things where there's no, there's very little joy. There's, it's, it's not a happy scene. It's not a, you know, for most of the other musical stuff, you know, there is uh, excitement and there, well, excitement's not right, the right word, but there's, there, there's, there's joy and there's happy memories and there's, there's great nostalgia. Hardcore, it was something bleak in its time. And so the, so the nostalgia for it is bleak. And um, not with you, of course. See, you, you've managed to find the, uh, you know, the interesting high points of it and, 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 and record them. Um, I, I wouldn't want it to be a template for my kids, you know, I, I, I mean, who are older. So, well, one of them, you know, was kind of into it, but um, it's a mixed, emotionally, it's a mixed bag. And I hope people learn from it. So, I hope that's not too dire a thing, but that's, you know, that's what I think. I worked on it. It's, it's not a happy scene. It's not well-adjusted, happy people having a good time, you know? So if you write about like 70s rock, everybody's having a riot, you know? And if you write about American hardcore, they, as in the hardcore scene of the day, it's, uh, it's not always a pretty picture. But that's America, you know, but it's great in that it's, a, and the, I think you captured this very well, it's a, it's a piece of Americana, it's history. I mean, reading it, it's like, you know, it's like reading about the, the late, you know, the, 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 any of the political upheaval and turmoil that, that the 20th century saw. So, there you go. American awesome. Heart, R.I.P. So I'll leave it at that. Uh, George Petros, thank you so much for coming on the American Hardcore Podcast, and everyone else, we'll see you next time on the American Hardcore Podcast. Mm -hmm.